Welcome to South Park City Museum, a 19th century mining boomtown in 21st century Colorado. Hello, my name is Erin Pulsifer and I am the curator at South Park City Museum. In today's video, we bring you a virtual tour of the Mayor home and the amazing story of one of Fairplay's most famous residents, Frank Mayer, the last of the Buffalo Hunters. Before we get started, please take just a moment to subscribe to our channel. It helps us out very much, and if you hit that notification bell, you'll never miss a thing. We post new videos on the first Friday of every month. And now, let's visit the Mayer home. Still standing on its original site, the Mayer home was built in late 1873 or early 1874, just after the devastating Fairplay fire. We know this because the newspaper used to insulate the walls, uncovered 112 years later, were all from the year 1873. This cheery yellow house was the home of Colonel Frank Mayer for the last 12 years of his life. After his death, the home was privately owned by Mrs. Lucy Roth, the wife of Frank Mayer's co-author, Charles B. Roth. Mayer and Roth wrote The Buffalo Harvest together, which was published after Mayer's death. Mrs. Roth had good intentions of preserving Mayer's legacy, but the general public were rarely allowed inside during her ownership. So, for the first 26 years that South Park City Museum was open, the Mayer home was mostly closed. There were signs in front of the house for visitors to read, but they were left to peek through the window to try and get a glimpse of the inside. It remained that way, filled with Mayer's possessions, until Mrs. Roth's death. The museum was able to purchase the Mayer home from Mrs. Roth's estate in 1985. It took almost a decade to bring the home back to its original state. The museum did what it could, restoring and opening one room at a time. The exterior was painted and repaired, Roth and Mayer's possessions were sorted and conserved, and slowly, the Mayer home became what it is today. It received its yellow paint job and a facelift in September of 2000. Today, Mayer's home has been fully restored and it is filled with period furniture and artifacts which represents his lifestyle. Let's take a look at what made Frank Mayer a Wild West legend. Frank Mayer lived a long and eventful life. He was an author, a drummer boy in the Civil War, and he was a legendary buffalo hunter during the second half of the 19th century. He wrote articles about his experiences as early as 1895, either under his own name or his pen name, Montezuma. During the last decade of his life, he was popular with reporters, being a last link to the Wild West. Mayer was a skilled storyteller, a well-known eccentric, Frank would rarely do an interview unless the reporter showed up with a bottle of wild turkey as a tribute. And, as the interview drew on, the whiskey worked its magic, and Mayer's tales would grow ever more impressive and fantastical. Mayer was born in New Orleans, Louisiana in 1850. When he was five years old, his family moved to Pennsylvania and settled in the Allegheny Mountains, where his love for hunting and fishing was born. At the age of 13, Mayer lied about his age and enlisted in the Union Army as a drummer boy. In 1953, Mayer was interviewed by the Denver Post's Empire Magazine. In that interview, he talked about his 35 years in the U.S. Army, where, in addition to the Civil War, he fought in the Indian Wars and in the 1898 Spanish-American War. He claimed that he earned the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. After the war, Mayer, still a young man, headed west looking for adventure and fortune. In his book, The Buffalo Harvest, Mayer tells of his experiences in the West. At the close of any war, there are bound to be thousands of young men who find peacetime pursuits too dull for their adventure-stirred lives. Maybe that was truer after the Civil War than at any other time. I know how I felt. I was restive. I wanted out. Fortunately for us, then, we had what you don't have now. We had a frontier to conquer. It was a very good substitute for war. I have since learned that there never was a buffalo on the American continent. It didn't matter to me in 1872 that the animal I pursued was not a buffalo, but a bison. It was all one. He walked. He had a hide. The hide was worth money. I was young, 22. I could shoot. I liked to hunt. I needed adventure. Here was it. Wouldn't you have done the same thing if you had been in my place? All I knew was that there were millions of wild animals loose on the plains and I needed money. 
Buffalo running as a business got started around 1870. I got into it in 1872, when the rampage was at its height. The whole western country went buffalo wild. It was like a gold rush, or a uranium rush. Men left jobs, businesses, wives and children, and future prospects to get into buffalo running. They sold whatever they had and put the money into outfits, wagons, camp equipment, rifles and ammunition. I needn't talk, I did it myself, and why not? There were uncounted millions of the beasts, hundreds of millions. We forced ourselves to believe. Their hides were worth two to three dollars each, which was a lot of money in 1872. And all we had to do was take these hides from their wearers. It was a harvest. We were the harvesters. Mayer was very successful and proud of his work. He was not oblivious to the real world effects of these bison harvests on the Native American population. He wrote, I'm often asked now what my feeling is toward myself that I helped wipe out a noble American animal by being sort of a juvenile delinquent with a high-powered rifle. I always am frank in answering. I always say I am neither proud nor ashamed. At the time, it seemed a proper thing to do. Looked at from a distance, however, I'm not so sure. The slaughter was perhaps a shameless, needless thing, but it was also an inevitable thing, an historical necessity. What I mean by that is this. The buffalo served his mission, fulfilled his destiny in the history of the Indian by furnishing him everything he needed. Food, clothing, home, a tradition, even a theology. But the buffalo didn't fit in so well with the white man's encroaching civilization. He didn't fit in at all, in fact. He could not be controlled or domesticated. He couldn't be corralled behind wire fences. He was a misfit, so he had to go. The lives of Native American tribes were closely connected with the lives of the bison. The destruction and near extinction of the American bison ran parallel with the destruction of the Native Americans' way of life. Mayer saw firsthand the toll that the buffalo runners took on the American bison population. A couple of years before, it was nothing to see 5,000, 10,000 buff in a day's ride. Now, if I saw 50, I was lucky. Presently, all I saw was rotting red carcasses or bleaching white bones. We had killed the golden goose. Only 500 bison remained in Montana by 1900, the majority of which were in Yellowstone National Park. It wasn't until Congress passed legislation to protect birds and animals living in Yellowstone National Park that the bison were able to make a comeback. Now numbering in the hundreds of thousands, the bison is the official American national mammal. Mayer claimed to have a good relationship with Native American tribes. He wrote about obtaining permission from a Comanche chief to hunt as many buffalo as he could. However, sometime during his service, he was shot in the shoulder with an arrow. The arrowhead stayed in his shoulder until he was 101 years old, when it finally bothered him enough to have it removed. Mayer also claimed to have met the famous dancehall girl and folk hero Silver Heels while he was a U.S. Marshal in Buckskin Joe. In his interview with Empire Magazine, Mayer provides great detail about Silver Heels even going so far as to describe her dance routines. Her audiences were prospectors and trappers, and every last man of them was infatuated with her. When she finished her dance, they'd throw their pokes of gold on the stage, and I've seen as many as 54 pokes there. When the terrible smallpox epidemic broke out in Buckskin Joe, Silver Heels worked tirelessly nursing the victims. She used her money to bring doctors from Colorado Springs and Denver. The least we could do was name a mountain after her. As the legend says, when the smallpox epidemic was over in Buckskin Joe, Silver Heels had vanished, never to be seen again. As always, Mayer was a gifted storyteller. However, when the smallpox epidemic broke out in Buckskin Joe in 1861, Mayer was 11 years old and still living in Pennsylvania, so it's unlikely that he was there to witness Silver Hill's heroism firsthand. Frank Mayer married Marjorie Monroe in 1877. They were married for 44 years until her death in 1921. He outlived her by 33 years, and he never remarried. When asked about her in an interview in 1953, at the age of 103, he became emotional, saying, I buried my heart with her. Mayer lived in fair play for the last two decades of his life. 
He lived a few miles out of town until he was in his 90s and he couldn't manage the three mile walk into town. He then made his last move to the little house on Front Street. Mayer lived in the house until he was taken to the old Fairplay Hospital where he died on February 12, 1954, three months shy of his 104th birthday. He was buried at the Fairplay Cemetery. At the end of his life, he was quoted as saying that he led a full life and didn't have any regrets. If only we could all be so lucky. The Mayer home runs neatly parallel with the street. Its false front and cornice work make a grand first impression. It also boasts two front doors, which was in fashion in the 1800s. The Pioneer home just across the street also has two front doors. In more affluent homes, the dual doors served specific purposes. One door was for everyday use and the other for more formal occasions, such as dinner parties, dances, or funerals, which at this point in history were almost always held in the home. We'll enter through the door on the left, the everyday door, which brings us in to the dining room. A modest table sits in the middle of the room ready for guests. A fine lace tablecloth covers the table, and the walls are home to taxidermy and paintings of Western landscapes. The art and decor were chosen to represent Mayer's lifestyle and adventures. To the right, through the arch draped with green fabric, we can head into the parlor. A beautiful wood stove would have kept this part of the house warm during the long South Park winters. A neat leather rocking chair takes its place next to the stove, and a settee sits against the wall ready to receive visitors. Maybe this is where Frank Mayer held his many interviews with eager reporters. Through the door and we are in the bedroom. The bed belonged to Mayer in his last years. A washstand sits to the left of the bed and a dresser is situated on the opposite wall. Sunshine spills through the lace curtains making the bedroom a sunny and cheerful place. Through the next door and we reach the kitchen. The huge wood-burning stove is stationed on the left wall and would have provided heat and a place to cook. A small table is pushed up near the window, offering an informal place to eat meals. The Hoosier cabinet opposite the stove would have served as a workstation and storage for flour, bulk ingredients, and dishes. To the left of the cabinet is the door to the last room in this building, Mayor's study. In the corner stands the home's third wood-burning stove, the ornate stove must have been a cheery addition to the study in the winter months. A modest roll-top desk sits against the left-hand wall. Imagine all of the stories that Mayer must have put down on paper here. A bison hide hangs over the desk, layered with a painting of elk. Next to the door, a display case shows excerpts from the buffalo harvest and photos from Mayer's long life. If you would like to see the Mayer home in person, South Park City Museum is open from May 15th to October 15th every year. The museum welcomes visitors from all over the world. As a nonprofit organization, South Park City survives on the proceeds from ticket sales and private donations. If you'd like to contribute, the link to our donation page is below. Your donation will be put to work maintaining these historic buildings and will help conserve over 60,000 artifacts. What do you think of Mayor's long and adventure-filled life? What other topics would you like to see covered on this channel? Let us know in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for joining us. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving us a thumbs up. We'll see you next time.